When I was in Israel just two weeks after the atrocities occurred in October, my brother asked me to share a few words at his daughter, my niece's bat mitzvah. It was, as I have shared in this community, bone chilling to be there. The wounds of October 7th were so fresh. Even today, more than four months later, it's hard not to think about it every single morning when I rise. And I, like I'm sure many of us, have found that images and stories are seeping into my consciousness throughout every single day. Back then, in that house, on that day, it filled the air. It was an air of shock and horror and disbelief and agony and personal and collective pain. So what rabbinic message, I wondered, could hold that space on that day as we mixed the way that Jews do the joy of my niece's bat mitzvah with the enormous impenetrable darkness of the time? So I shared with my brother's community the most foundational Torah that I have, a Torah that you have heard me speak about many times in this place. The idea that in the presence of immense suffering and agony and grief, we are called to be human with one another, to see each other, not to turn away even in the worst and hardest moments. We are called to say amen to each other. In fact, that first line of Mourner's Kaddish, as you may now know, is not even a full sentence. It's the beginning of a sentence. The mourner stands up and just begins to express her anguish, and the community dares to interrupt her to proclaim, before you go on, know this. We're right here. We're right here, and we are not going to abandon you. With all that you are holding now, all of the pain in your heart, all of the horror of this new reality, life without your loved one, the one thing that you can trust is our presence, our love. But that's not all. We are not only going to love you, we say, but we are going to love you relentlessly. Amen, ve amen, ve amen, ahava, bilti poseket, relentless love. This week's Torah portion begins with the commandment that the Israelites, lahalot ner tamid, they are to light the eternal light, the ner tamid. That light would dwell in the holiest place, in the Mishkan, and it would be a constant reminder of God's love of our people and our love right back to God. Melissa used to joke that our Ner Tamid, which was a petulant little light that would flicker on and off during services and sometimes not go on at all, was really more of a Ner Lefamim, a sometimes light, occasionally gracing us with its glow. But actually... The rabbis are clear that the original light was actually not on all the time either. On one hand, tamid means always, but tamidut actually connotes not continuously, but continually. Do you know the difference between these two words? Continual means something that happens frequently or even regularly, something that starts and stops and then starts again. But continuous means something that never stops. It's like a circle. It just goes on and on and on. The holy light, the ner tamid, is continual. Rashi makes this really clear. Kol laila velaila karui tamid. When something happens every single night, night after night after night, we call that tamid. And that is the holy goalpost. In other words, the great power is in is not in igniting a light and letting it shine forevermore, but rather in igniting a light and then relighting it every single day. This is the holier path, obviously, because it requires ongoing commitment and continual presence. Rather than saying, I love you forever, this is saying, I love you today, and I will choose to love you again tomorrow. And then on the next day, and then on the next day again. We've seen the power of this relentless, continual love in our own community. Ellen spoke so powerfully about it earlier today, about Todd and Sharon and their determination to meet her in her grief, not on one Friday and not on two, but Friday after Friday after Friday, every single week for six years. 
Todd and Sharon made a spiritual practice of caring for their friend after the death of her son by showing up continually, consistently, reliably. Yes, this is the holy gift that we give one another, the gift that we are training for when we say mourner's Scottish. I won't only be there for the funeral, but I'll also be there for the shiva, and then for the yard site, and for every yiskor, and also just on Friday, because Fridays are hard. I will be with you again and again and again to let you know that you are held with love. The power of continual expressions of love or commitment or presence is that it requires agency. It requires of us that we step back and then step forward again every single time. We don't live only in the reverberations of a one-time commitment. We choose each other day after day after day. And this is the promise that I made to that beautiful broken community that day in Israel, bereft and bereaved just two weeks after the worst atrocities against our people since the Shoah, since the Holocaust. I will choose to see you again and again and again. I will not turn away from you. I will never forget or neglect or diminish your pain or your humanity or your fear or your dreams. When the whole world turned upside down, I worried that everyone was losing their minds. No matter what happens, I warned, we must not meet their madness with our own. We must not lose our damn minds. But holding our sanity, let alone our empathy, has become even more challenging than I could have imagined at the time. I've been traveling around the country. I can see the toll that this war is taking on our people on our community. Not only are we grieving the losses of October 7th, but we do not feel safe here in the United States. We do not feel at home anymore. All of our Jewish intergenerational trauma has been ignited, both by the atrocities and by the response from so many people in the world. And all of this is making it very difficult for us to function, let alone to look at the war effort with moral clarity. It's clear to me now that when we are in trauma, anguish, and fear, we are not our best selves. It is not possible to experience empathy, Dr. Alyssa Appel told me, in the absence of social safety. In light of all of this, I have been thinking as I've traveled around a lot about Shiva that week that my family and I spent in my parents' home after my father's death a few months ago, that most intense period of mourning after a loss. When one is in Shiva, we don't leave our homes. We are surrounded only by love. An enemy does not visit the Shiva house. As the Ramah writes, lo yivaker chola velo yinachem avel. An enemy does not go to visit the sick, nor does he comfort a mourner. Why? Because it will only compound that person's pain. That person needs to focus on healing and on grieving. So instead, in our moments of deepest grief, we are fed by love. We are comforted by love. We are held by love. We are surrounded by love. But one cannot stay in Shiva forever. When we emerge, the first thing that we do is we take a walk around the block, and that is our reintroduction to the world beyond our own pain. Look, we say, there's our neighbor who also just lost a loved one. Oh, and look, this young couple just bought a house across the way, just starting their life together. This sacred walk expands the scope of our moral concern beyond our own fear and grief and trauma. This doesn't mean that we are no longer in pain. This does not mean that we are abandoning our own people. It means that we recognize that we are not alone in our pain, that there's a whole world of human suffering out there. This gives us a chance to start to see and to act with a different kind of clarity. I say this now because I know that many in our Jewish community are still deep in Shiva. There are still 134 hostages that are being held by Hamas in Gaza. 
We are suspended between life and death, and I understand it. I really do. And I also know that there are some, both here and in Israel, who have started to take their walk around that block. They are not, we are not, abandoning our grieving family, but we are able to see a larger picture, and it is a picture of immense, immeasurable human suffering. There is a massive, devastating crisis of human suffering that is unfolding in Gaza. The loss of life experienced there is unimaginable. And while the egregious language, the libelous language against Israel and the Jewish people around this war makes it hard for us some days to even see straight, we, the Jewish people, must be morally clear as we speak out about the humanitarian catastrophe that is unfolding before our eyes. Hundreds of thousands of people in Gaza are suffering now without clean water, food, or medication. Women and men and babies, pregnant people. Speaking honestly about this is not abandoning our own people and it is not undermining our own pain. It's just being human. It's just being Jews. The more we learn about the way that the attacks of October 7th were planned and executed, the harder it is to imagine ever being neighbors with the people who engaged in those horrible and barbarous acts. And at the same time, I never in my life imagined that I would see Jewish people laying their bodies on the street to protest humanitarian aid trucks entering into Gaza. These people are starving to death. Have we forgotten our most foundational claim of our faith that every single person is created in God's own image and must be treated as an image of the divine? For months, we have been saying and we have been echoing the call of our partners on the ground, Israelis and Palestinians, who have been arguing that there is no military solution to this terrible conflict. And yet every day the suffering persists and worsens. This war must end. This war must end. No more fighting, no more death, no more funerals for 22-year-old kids, no more families buried beneath the rubble, entire lines lost to history. The hostages must be returned home to their loved ones, every single one of them, and massive amounts of humanitarian aid must get to the people of Gaza immediately. And Israeli and Palestinian leadership must commit to a long-term negotiated peace. If they're not willing to go there on their own, they must be pressured by every lever of power possible. That is why we here have been platforming and will continue to platform Israelis and Palestinians who, despite their own broken hearts, have stepped out of their own shiva with a clarion call. They refuse to believe that the only way forward is the way of eternal war. Instead, together, they are choosing to imagine a different kind of future, a future in which two peoples can live in dignity and peace and security and self-determination. And I know that right now, these are minority voices, but their way is the only way forward. So we, the diaspora community, must resource and amplify their messages. Being clear about this call does not diminish our connection to our family. I promised my brother's community that day, I will not turn away from you. I will never forget or neglect your pain or your humanity or your fear or your dreams, and I will not. I promised that I would choose love, choose solidarity, choose presence again and again and again. Remember, continual love and commitment is not unexamined love and commitment. Others may find this position that I am espousing weak or disappointing or traitorous, 
But our values are our bedrock. The only thing that we can do is be exactly who we are. Hold our Jewish values, hold them close, even when the whole world has lost its mind. So I am pleading with this community, please do not entrench, do not put on blinders, do not jump on any bandwagon. Examine, read, listen, learn. I will never downplay the seriousness of the threats against our Jewish people. And I will fight to make sure that my moral compass and our communities is defined not by fear, but by our core values. And I will do that bitmidut again and again and again. Shabbat shalom.